Shall we rise up to pray? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for once again gathering before you together. As children of God, with other children of God, to learn at the feet of Christ. We thank you for the great revelation you have preserved for us in your word. In this great, marvelous, awesome book of Daniel. Lord, we pray that everything you have for us will receive and none of us will miss your blessing in Jesus' name. Reveal your truth, your mind, your will, your secret unto every one of us in Jesus' name. That by the revelation of your word, we'll walk through this wilderness of a world and will not stumble. Your light will guide us. Your spirit will speak to us. Your hand will hold us. And then your power will strengthen us. Until we appear before you face to face in glory land in Jesus name. Bless us together Lord and those who are still coming. Speed them up. That we will enjoy your blessings together. In Jesus name we pray. Once again, I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight. It's always a blessed time, a wonderful time. As we come together and we open the pages of the scripture of truth. And tonight we have something very essential, very important. The Lord wants to reveal unto us. Pick that word, take that word, hold that word, reveal. Whenever you come to the Lord, he wants to reveal something covered. Something veiled, something hidden, something that has been kept secret from the minds of men. He unveils, he reveals, he opens up, he takes the lead away. That's a special thing the Lord did for Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel by the Spirit of the Lord in the passage we're looking at today. And that is what God wants to do for you. For you to see the revelation of what he has for you. As you look at the title of the Bible study, The Amazing Recovery, The Amazing Rediscovery of a Lost Revelation. You remember if you were here last week that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, a frightening dream, an awesome dream, a great dream. But when he woke up, he had forgotten And the details of what he saw in the dream, even though he had forgotten, troubled him, frightened him. It was a great dream that alarmed him. And so he was thrown into a period, a point of crisis in his life. He called all the magicians and astrologers and all the sorcerers of the land, the wise men of the land of Babylon, to come and recover, rediscover the dream. But they said, O king, this is rare. This is an impossible request to demand. Nobody had ever demanded this of any of the people, members of the cabinet, or the parliament, or wise men of any land. Tell us the dream. And then we will show you the interpretation. He said, but I told you just now, I've forgotten all about it. But you must discover it. And tell me. If you don't tell me, I'm going to a kind of cut you in pieces. You, you are going to lose your life. Then they said, oh king, you don't do like this because this is impossible. He became angry. He became furious. And then he commanded, he set up a decree that all those wise men should be destroyed, killed, and their houses made dung hill. You will remember that we have uh, three uh, brothers there, friends, companions, fellows in the same faith. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were part of the wise men of Babylon because they have been trained. And were part of the people that surrounded Nebuchadnezzar around his throne. And so they were looking for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so that they could be killed. That's the point where we were last week. And now we want to find out, how did the whole story turn out? What now happened to our three friends and Daniel the champion? 
We're looking at it now from verse 17. Open your Bible with me. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning their secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Obviously, you can tell it was a time of crisis for the king and for the wise men in Babylon. The king had had a dream which he had forgotten. It was not an ordinary dream. It was a dream whose meaning and fulfillment will span the whole period of the times of the Gentiles. It was a dream that revealed the conflict of the ages. The conflict of the powerful kingdoms of the world, which will culminate in the destruction of all the kingdoms of, on the earth. And then the establishment of the kingdom of Christ, eternal kingdom. It was the greatest and the most extraordinary dream in the whole of the Bible. Pick any dream in the Bible. You'll find that many of those dreams, some related to individuals, some related to families, some related to a particular tribe, and some related to a particular warrior like Gideon, some related to a whole nation. In this case, it relates to the whole world from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to the time of the Babylonian, of the Middle Persians, and to the time of the Greek and the time of the Romans, even to the time of the coming of Christ. It's a wide sweeping dream. From that time till the time the Lord will come again. And what Nebuchadnezzar saw was so terrifying. The great warrior king was frightened. The dream greatly troubled his spirit. And he woke up alarmed and terrified. What details in the dream actually terrified him? What details alarmed him? We don't know. He didn't even remember. He had forgotten, but he remained agitated and frightened. In the course of history, as this prophetic dream unfolds, as shaking and kingdom-destroying wars will claim many lives in violent deaths, the sight of what will happen in the coming centuries would make strong men tremble and will make stout hearts quake. In fact, Jesus Christ said, men's hearts will fail them for fear. But looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, he says there will be distress of nations with perplexity. And actually, the fear, the trembling, the quaking of Nebuchadnezzar was a kind of prelude, a foretaste, a representation of the distress of the nations with perplexity that will come upon the kings and the nations of the world, upon the princes and the people all over the Gentile world. As we're talking about the forgotten dream, we talk about the unforgettable Daniel. Daniel had been prepared for that time of crisis. Now, that's very important. For there to be a man, for God to raise up somebody, in a time of crisis, and Daniel was such a man, God's a man, in the midst of crisis, and he met crisis with calmness, he faced conflict with courage, he walked through chaos and confusion with confidence in God, he turned frustration to fascination. I want to ask you a question, what kind of a man is there? That will be the man for crisis, for a time of crisis. Number one, it may be a personal crisis that you have, and then God raises up a man for that personal crisis. It may be a family crisis that you have, and then in that crisis and confusion, in that family, God raises up a man that is able to solve that problem. It may be a community crisis. You know, around us here, uh, there was crisis. Just a few weeks, a few days ago. And then God has to raise up a man that will quench the whole thing, quell the whole thing. A man for the time, for the day, for the period of crisis. Sometimes it is 
national crisis. And in that national crisis, God raises up a man. Like in the case of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. That was not only for Nebuchadnezzar, not only for Babylon, for all the wise men. Because you understand that Babylon was a world empire. And that was a wide, worldwide crisis. And God raised up a man. Whenever a crisis appears, what kind of a man is that? That God will raise up to solve the problem. May I show you from the life of Daniel number one. The person will be a prayerful man. If you're going to be a man for the hour, for the time of crisis. Number one, you'll be a prayerful man. Number two, a principled man. A man of conviction. A man of principle that says, there is where I stand. And not only that, number three, a prepared man. You see how God had prepared Daniel for this hour, for this time. Because God had actually equipped him and prepared him that he'll be able to discover the dream and the vision and then be able to interpret. Number four, he'll be a pure, impartial man you cannot bribe. A pure person. Because, you know, in the case of Daniel, he was a righteous man. Number five, a prudent man. That's a wise man. And speaking with wisdom, if you are found in a crisis, in the very midst of a crisis, what are you going to do? It's only when you have that wisdom, prudence. Not only that, number six, a peace-loving man. A peaceful man. If, if there's crisis, and there's crisis all around. If you're going to be used of God, to be able to resolve that situation in that crisis, number one, a prayerful man. We're looking at Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and prayed and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. If you're going to be a man, a woman of a woman that is able to resolve problems and bring peace at the time of crisis, you'll be a man, a woman of prayer. In fact, what did Daniel do? He went to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he said, "Come on now, we need to pray." And they prayed. Not only that, a principled man, a person of principle. A person of conviction that she know that this is the will of God. God is revealing something and he wants us to know it. And because of that, we need to get this from the Lord. And only from the Lord can we get this. Daniel was a principled man. It wasn't a kind, a kind of, you know, an amphibian that will be in Rome and do as the Romans do and then be in Babylon and do as the Babylonians did. He was a principled man. If you want to be used of God in the hour and the time and the period of crisis, you'll be a man of principle. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat and with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Number three, a prepared man. The Lord had prepared Daniel for this hour. What's the crisis about? It's about a dream. That had been forgotten. What's the crisis about? We need to recover that dream. What's the crisis about? We need to know the proper interpretation and meaning of that dream. Daniel was prepared for that. Before a crisis comes, if you're going to be the man God will use to resolve that situation, that problem, the Lord must have prepared you before that time. In chapter 1 of Daniel, verse 17, it says, And as for these four children, God Give them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. He was a prepared man. And you know about Daniel number four. was a pure person. Righteous. Holy. Pure. Pure within and pure without. He wasn't fooling around with all the other Babylonians and doing the things they did. And eating what they ate. 
and dressing the way they dressed and speaking using the same foul language that they used to know. He was a pure, perfect man. In Daniel chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. Daniel chapter 6 verse 4 Then the prince, the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Number five, he was a prudent man. That means he was a wise man. That man had wisdom, correct wisdom, profitable wisdom, problem solving wisdom, and fear subduing wisdom. The kind of, the kind of wisdom that made it not to panic when there was a problem because he knew there must be solution to every problem on earth. And as long as God is still alive, and we still believe in Him, and we are associated, affiliated, and we are related to Him, we know He will give us the solution to the problem. The kind of wisdom that you have, that you know, the wisdom of Christ and the wisdom of the Lord is available for you. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 14. Daniel chapter 2 verse 14. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. He answered with counsel and wisdom. And then if you are going to be a person that will solve problems at the time of crisis, and sometimes it's even church crisis, religious crisis, a community where you live, the community of faith, the people that believe in the Lord, there is a misunderstanding, there is a conflict, and there is a crisis. And God is looking for a man, God is looking for a woman that will bring solution to the crisis in the local church you belong to. That means then, if you're going to be a man like that, you'll be a peace-loving man. A peace-loving woman. And that was the kind of life that Daniel lived. He was never found in any conflict. He was never the originator of any confusion. He was a peace-loving man. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 9. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, the peacemakers. The peace was not there before. The mind of Nebuchadnezzar was agitated and frightened. And then the magicians and the wise men of Babylon, the Chaldeans were afraid and panicky for their lives. But now here comes a maker of peace that brought peace in the community. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. I pray you'll be such a believer. That you'll be prayerful, principled, prepared, pure, prudent, and peaceful. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2. As we look at our study today, we're looking at the amazing recovery of a lost revelation. The amazing recovery of a lost revelation. Oh, we're dividing it to uh, three parts. Number one, praying for God's divine revelation with confidence. Praying. For God's divine revelation with confidence. Number two, praising God for divine revelation during crisis. After you pray and God answers the prayer. And then praising God for divine revelation during crisis. Number three, proclaiming God's divine revelation with courage. Proclaiming God's divine revelation with courage. We come to point number one. Daniel chapter 2, we're reading from verse 17 once again. Then Daniel went to his house and made the sin known to Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's companions that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning their secret and that, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish. Was the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. 
And from what we have learned already from last week, we started this section. The executioner, that is the captain of the king's guard, had gotten to Daniel already. And he came to execute, he came to kill, he came to destroy. And then Daniel said, what is the king's commandment and decree and demand so urgent? Why are we in a hurry? What are we making haste about? And then the man revealed everything to Daniel. And then we're told that Daniel answered with counsel and with wisdom. He was calm and composed. You know, fear, worry, anxiety, panic, will lessen man's ability to think clearly. When you're afraid, you're not able to think clearly. And then will lessen the ability to act wisely. When you are afraid and you are frightened, you are not able to take actions with wisdom. And then will limit people and lessen their ability to pray confidently. But in the case of Daniel, nothing like that. No fear, no worry, no anxiety. He knew all things work together for good. To them who are the called of God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Because of that, he simply asked the question, why is the decree so hasty from the king? He was conscious of God's protection. A believer who is conscious of God's presence, conscious of God's promise, conscious of God's power, conscious of God's protection, will be calm knowing that all will end well at the end of the crisis. Because a child of God will know that God is still on the throne. And this secret that the king is looking for, the Lord has the secret, and the Lord will reveal to his own child. Daniel demanded time of the king and found favor with the king. The king had been hasty in verse 15 and would not allow the wise men to get time. That's in verse 8. But he granted Daniel his request because Daniel assured him, don't worry about this king. I will reveal this interpretation unto you. Daniel had great faith and confidence in God. Even before praying, he believed that God would reveal the forgotten dream and its interpretation unto him. And then he went to pray. Whenever you have situations like that, something forgotten, something lost, something hidden, that has become a secret, the, the right thing to do is to pray. Pray like Daniel. You see, is that possible to lose some? Uh, of course, yes, sometimes. It's even a, it's a simple thing. A bunch of keys is lost. And you need to have that key to be able to get into where you have deposited something very important. Not only that, beyond a key, a certificate is misplaced, lost, hidden forgotten and you need to present that certificate in a place where maybe you are going for an interview but now the scene is lost you cannot find it there's something more than that a child is missing and that child that is lost is not dead it's somewhere and you're looking for that child. And now you need to pray and be able to have revelation of the Lord to be able to discover where to find that child. Sometimes you take somebody to a meeting, a retreat, or a church meeting. And while you are within the crowd, the child, the person is missing. You look here and there. Where is this fellow? And the community is bothering you, troubling you. Where is the man? Where is the woman? Produce the man. Have you gone to sacrifice the woman? The, the woman is lost. And you want to discover this secret. Sometimes it's your wife. She traveled out. And then you expect her. She should have come back yesterday. But she is not there. What is she? And we're calling here and there, and yes, she is still alive. There's something happened. And by the way, you are now almost dying of hypertension and fear and panic because you cannot discover where she is. That's what I was studying about Daniel. That it comes to a point in somebody's life. Something missing. Something lost. Something hidden. Something forgotten. We must recover now. That's why we're looking at Daniel. How did he recover this? How did he discover what had been forgotten and hidden and lost? Daniel called his companions 
to prayer concerning this secret that they that they had they had to pray for revelation and inspiration. It was not a prayer by curious men wanting to see spurious miracle of revelation. Their lives were at stake. Their lives were in danger. And the sentence of death was hanging on all the wise men of Babylon. If the secret would not be made known unto the king, they must pray or perish of the rest of the wise men of Babylon, and this was a secret. Uh, can you t- can you see in this passage how many times it's referred to this secret or the secret? Let me show you. We're looking at verse nineteen. Look at verse nineteen. Then was the secret revealed. It's referred to a secret, and then you look at verse twenty-two. He that revealeth deep and secret things. Everybody knew this was a secret. That's why they mentioned it over and over. In verse 28, it says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And then in verse 29, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy, upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee. What shall come to pass? And then in verse 30 it says, But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. And so you know, everybody knew that this was a secret they were looking for. And uh, when you think about secret, come on to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. I'm reading to you there from verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. You know, some people read that passage of scripture. The secret things, the hidden things, the forgotten things, the things that are in the dark, that nobody knows. Those secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The way some people read that determined chapter 29, verse 29 is, oh, they say, the secret things belong to the Lord. Full stop. Only God knows that. Only God can di- discover that. Only God can explain that. Only God can find that out. They don't pray. They say, the secret things belong to the Lord. Full stop. But it says, the things that are revealed belong unto us. How will those secret things be revealed? Just do like Daniel and go and pray. And go and seek the face of the Lord. And seek for the mind of the Lord. What does he want to do about this? How does he want to reveal this unto his own children? And if we pray, those secret things will be revealed to us in Jesus' name. Now you'll see that Daniel, he made use of something. He called the other people. He wasn't going to pray alone. He called the other people to pray along with him. We're looking at Psalm 50. Psalm 50, I'm reading from verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me. That's exactly what Daniel did. He didn't gather sinners together. And there's not going to be much coming out of a prayer meeting that you have with saints and sinners, believers and unbelievers, Christians and criminals. No. But gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And Daniel knew, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these were people that were converted, consecrated, committed unto the Lord. He gathered those people of like precious faith together so that they could pray. When you come to a point of crisis in your life as a believer, don't go and call on believers, sinners, criminals. 
The people that do not know God and say, come and pray with me. Don't go to prayer houses where they burn candles. They don't know God. They do not have the spirit of God. Neither do they have the torch and the transformation of God in their lives. But people of like precious faith, people of uncompromising life, people of uncommon faith, following after the Lord. Those are the people to gather together. Gather my saints together unto me. The people that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And then it says in verse 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble, in the day of crisis, in the day of trial, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. The Lord will deliver you. You will not die with the people of Babylon. But life will come to you in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 33. Verse 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee. In the day of crisis, don't forget the promise of God. You know what people do? In fact, it's because of fear. When crisis arises and when crisis comes... Immediately you get into panicking. You get into fear. And you're trembling. And that makes you to forget the promises of God. But if you are calm and cool and collected. And know that the crisis does not unseat God. The crisis does not kill God. The crisis does not dethrone God. God is still on the throne. Whatever the conflict and whatever the crisis and whatever the problem, God is still there. The promises are still there. And prayer is still a possibility. And the people of God can still hold on to the promises of God. And so don't ever forget in the day of trouble, in the day of crisis, in the day of conflict, it says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Isn't that what, what Daniel had? The dream that nobody knew, the interpretation that nobody knew, he called upon the Lord, and the Lord showed him that which he knew not. I just read to you in Daniel chapter 2, how this is referred to over and over as a secret. The question is, what kind of man... What kind of woman does God reveal the secrets to? And that takes us to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. If you want to be a favorite of God, that the secret is revealed unto you. As you're opening Psalm 25, let me ask you a question on your journey while you're going to Psalm 25. If you have a secret, who do you reveal the secret to? Every dick and hurry on the street, no. Everybody living in your community, of course, no. We have a secret, something very precious. This is a precious secret unto you. Who do you reveal that to? Somebody you trust, somebody you love, a bosom friend, a person that is very close and intimate to you, a person of the same heart and the same affection with you. You say, come on now, come and hear something. I'll whisper it in your ears. You must know this. This is a secret with me. Those are the people who reveal secrets to. Who are the people that God reveals his secrets to? Not every deacon, Harry. Not every church goer, not every Bible carrier, not nominal Christians, those who are Christians in name, but not Christians in nature. Who are the people that God reveals his secrets to? In, uh, in uh, Psalm 25, I'm reading from verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The people that love the Lord, reverence him, honor him, fear him, and they want to obey him. Those are the people that have the secrets of the Lord. And if you want some secrets revealed unto you, revelations given unto you of things that are hidden, of things that many people do not know, then become close to God, honor God, reverence him, fear him, obey him, and be a righteous man, a righteous woman, following after the Lord, then will the secret of the Lord be revealed unto you. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 32, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 32, 
For the fraud is an abomination. It's abomination to the Lord. But the secret, but a secret is with the righteous. That is it. The secret of the Lord is with the righteous. And then, because, because Daniel was a righteous man, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also righteous. They loved the Lord. They followed after the Lord. And so the secret of the Lord was revealed unto them. They prayed in faith. They prayed nothing wavering. They prayed confidently asking wisdom of God that giveth unto all men liberally. It was a united prayer with men of like precious faith. Their motive in the prayer was pure and unselfish. You must have a right motive when you pray to, to have the secrets revealed unto you. There was no selfish desire or lust. It was, it was to save lives, the lives of others, and to provide solution to the king's dilemma and problem. You see, when you want solution to the problems of other people, and the Lord knows there's no, there's no selfish ambition, there's no selfish thought, there's no selfish personal sin. No. To be able to solve the problems of other people, that's why you are praying then God will reveal what you want him to reveal not only that, to preserve their own lives for further service and further service to God and to his covenant people with no iniquity in their hearts and with no condemnation in their hearts, with absolute confidence and faith in God's faithfulness, they knew that the answer would come speedily, and your answer will come speedily as a call upon the Lord, just like God answered Daniel speedily, the Lord will answer you speedily. We're coming to point number two now, praising God for divine revelation during crisis. Praising God for divine revelation during crisis. We're reading from verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. It is very instructive what Daniel has done there. God did not disappoint the faith of Daniel, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had gathered together in united prayer, fervently praying, believing the Lord that the Lord will answer. And the answer came. But you notice something? After receiving a speedy answer to that spectacular prayer, they did not hurriedly rush out of God's presence. He got to go and tell the king, we found it. We've discovered it. That secret, that revelation has been given unto us. We can tell you the dream and its interpretation. No, they were not in a hurry. They said, if God has done this unthinkable, incredible thing, seemingly impossible thing for us, we need to wait behind and praise the name of the Lord. They offered praise to God for his faithfulness and goodness. Daniel, as the leader of the team, praised God. But he did it with the other people. He said, I thank thee and I praise thee who has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. What we desired of thee. That makes us to know they prayed together. And then it says, you have made known unto us, unto us, the king's matter. And then he began to praise the name of the Lord. What did he praise the name of the Lord for? I'm reading now from verse, from verse 20. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, what did, why was he praising and blessing the name of the Lord? Number one, for wisdom and might are his. Daniel said, oh God, whatever wisdom I have, whatever wisdom I've demonstrated, is a little fraction of the wisdom that you have. For wisdom and might are his. Number two in verse 21, and he changes the times and the seasons. It says, he changes kingdoms, he changes empires, he changes emperors, he changes one from the other. He's saying, Nebuchadnezzar will not be on the throne forever. He changes times and seasons. Belshazzar will not be there forever. He changes times and seasons. And the kings who are there today, and the leaders who are there today, and the 
world emperors who are there today will not be there forever. It says God is forever alive. And God is King of kings and lots of, Lord of lords forever and ever. As for men, he changes them. He changes times and seasons. Number three, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. He said, you know, those people of the world, they think, you know, Nebuchadnezzar will think, I'm a king because I'm a mighty warrior. And then another, somebody in the world, the president will say, I'm there because my people voted for me. And then a governor will say, I am there because I won the majority of the votes. Another person will say, I am there because of who I am, my riches. I spent a lot of money in campaigning. And then now I am here because of the work of my hand. Everybody knows I'm better than every other person, every other contestant for the position. And Daniel says, no. He removed kings and set us up kings. It says, it's by the prerogative of God, by the decision of God. He puts one there and then remo- and gets another person of the place. And then number four, he giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to those that know, that have understanding. It says, it is God that does everything. Have you seen anybody with wisdom? God give it, gives him wisdom. Have you seen anybody with understanding? It is God that has given that understanding. That means then you have what you have because God has given it to you. He has what he has because God has given it to him. She has what she has because God has given it to her. And then number five, it says he reveals the deep and secret things. And it says it doesn't matter how deep into the earth. It doesn't matter how deep into the secrets of the hearts of men. However deep, however high, however far away. There is a God in heaven, number five. He reveals deep and secret things. Number six, that tells us now in verse, in verse 22, He knows what is in the darkness. He knows the sin in darkness. It doesn't matter. It may be a kind of darkness that you couldn't see anything or see anybody, but God knows everything in darkness. Number seven, the light dwelleth with him. That's what he was thanking God for. That's what he was praising God for. He went beyond just the dream, just the revelation that he had now. And he said, it's good to praise the Lord, thank the Lord, and bless the name of the Lord. See what the Lord has done. And see the depths of his understanding. And see the greatness of his gifts. He has given to his own people. Let me show you number one. That wisdom and might are his. Wisdom and might are his. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 32. You'll see that the praise of uh, the praise of God coming out of the mouth of Daniel is based on the scriptures. That man was saturated with scripture. That man was filled with scripture. That's why he prayed with confidence. And that's why he praised the Lord scripturally. He said uh, he, that wisdom and might are his. Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm reading verse 19. In verse 19 it says, Great in counsel and mighty in war, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give every one according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. In Job chapter 12, Job chapter 12, telling us wisdom and might are his. Verse 13, Job chapter 12, verse 13, for with him is wisdom and strength, he has counsel and understanding. Verse 16, with him is strength and wisdom. And the deceived and the deceiver are his. Everybody is under his control. Then you remember number two that Daniel praised the Lord because he changes the times and the seasons. That's a scriptural phrase, you understand, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 7. Acts 1 verse 7. Times and seasons. The times and the seasons are in his hand. He can change them whenever he pleases. Acts chapter 1 verse 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own 
power. It's under his control. He changes them whenever he needs to change them. And that's why Paul the Apostle was talking to these Thessalonian believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1 to verse 3. But of the times and the seasons. You see Daniel. Daniel had the knowledge of the past and the knowledge of the, of the future. In the past, the times and the seasons. All in the hand of the Almighty God. And as he looks into the future, and he says, Lord, I bless you. That, that you are a great God, a mighty God. And the times and the seasons are your hand, and you change them whenever you have to, whenever you want to. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I shall write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Then they said, praising the Lord. And the third reason he was praising the Lord is, he said, God removes kings and setteth up kings. No wonder Daniel was never bothered, was never worried. When those presidents came and he said, we're going to siege Daniel. We're going to get rich of Daniel. Because the king is trying to put him above all of us. is is reckoned as number one. And we're going to make sure we set up something. We're going to set up the king himself. And this Daniel will, will unseat him. Daniel was not worried. He knew. Isn't that why I was praising the Lord? He said, he removed kings and set us up kings. And if God is not removing Daniel, nobody can remove him. No impeachment will remove him. Because everything is in the hands of God. Daniel knew that. If you didn't know that, you'll be fighting to keep your position. You'll be fighting to keep your place. You'll be fighting to keep whatever it is you have. You say, this is mine. This position that I have, it may be a position in the church, a position in the place of work, a position in the family, or whatever, wherever, but you'll be fighting to keep it. But Daniel said, why fight? Why worry about that? Because everything is in the hands of God. He places one there. He removes the other one. What a great truth of scripture Daniel is revealing unto us. You wonder to there are many people. They fight on small, small things. Even, even on marriage. I want to grab that brother before another sister grabs him. Why? I want to hold on to that sister. She must get married to him before another brother grabs her. Why? Everything is in the hands of God. Relax and understand whatever God wants will be. And whatever God does not want will not be. There is no struggle and there is no conflict. Because Daniel has assured us, and that's according to the scripture. He removed kings and set us up. Kings. I'm reading from Psalm 75. Psalm 75 verses 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And that's what Daniel said. That's why I was praising God. If you knew that in your heart, every condition in your life, every situation in your life, you'll be praising God. When it appears that that thing, that position is slipping off away from you, you'll say, I don't worry. If it's mine, it will come back. If it's not mine, bye-bye. Let it go. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading verse 17. Daniel chapter Chapter 4. We're looking at the latter part of verse 17. Daniel chapter 4, latter part of verse 17. It says that the living may know that the most high rulers in the kingdoms of men and giveth thee to whomsoever he will and setteth up over each the basest of men. It's in the hand of God. And now Daniel was praising God because, number four, he giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He giveth wisdom. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6. Proverbs 
chapter 2 verse 6 the lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding he lays up sound wisdom for the righteous he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly what a revelation and also in ecclesiastes this is very important you must see this in your bible ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 26 ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 26 for god give it to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy no cause for envy no cause for jealousy you see that other brother looks like he has gotten wisdom no jealousy look at that sister she's got some knowledge no jealousy you see that individual that believer is full of joy unspeakable joy no jealousy because god give it to a man that is good in his sight you get interested in the lord and you get a kind of uh, so intimate with the lord and you'll find what he gives to other people he'll give to you god giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that she may give to him that is good before God. As we go on with what Daniel said, how Daniel praised the Lord. Number five, he praised the Lord because he revealed deep and secret things. He revealed deep and secret things. Job chapter 12 again. In Job chapter 12, we're looking at verse 22. Job chapter 12. Looking at verse 22. Job chapter 12 verse 22. He discovers deep things out of darkness. And bringeth out to light the shadow of death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10. How God reveals deep and secret things. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. That's what God does. And if there's any need today for you to discover those secret things and deep things, the Lord is still on the throne. And he's still alive. And his ability and his, uh, his, uh, his uh, quality changes not. His attributes change not. We're told, number six, that was praising God because God knoweth what is in the darkness. God knoweth what is in the darkness. In Job, we're back to Job again. Job chapter 26, verse 6. Job chapter 26, verse 6. Hell is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. That means then he knows everything, whether it's in the darkness or in the deep, in the ocean, anywhere. He knows everything. Everything is naked before him. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. How everything is open before God, known to God, naked before God. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And now number seven, light dwelleth with him. It says light dwelleth with the almighty God. That's why it brings everything to light in First Timothy chapter 6 verse 16. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 16. Who only has immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man have seen or can see to whom be honor and power everlasting amen in first john chapter one verse five first john chapter one we're reading from verse five here we're told about the almighty god light dwelleth with him and he dwells in the light we're told, this then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we if we say we walk in the light, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us 
from all sin. And so you find what this man, Daniel, was praising God about. And which you will praise the name of the Lord. Will glorify the name of the Lord. Daniel had prayed and the answer was given to him and to his companions. That was no ordinary answer to an ordinary prayer. The answer proved that God is greater than all gods. It proved that God is the, that the gods of the Gentile, of the Gentile nations are impotent, are powerless, are worthless. That the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. That Daniel and his friends were serving the true and the living God. And that the God of heaven is the only one worthy of our worship. Like Daniel and his companions, we must always praise God for his merciful intervention in our lives. When God has intervened in your life, when God has answered your prayer, when God has removed the death threat upon your life, when the Lord has cancelled the decree of the Babylonian king upon your life, when your family is preserved because of the mercy of God, we must thank the Lord and bless the Lord and praise the name of the Lord for his goodness and for his preservation for the fulfillment of his promise upon our lives. We'll come now to point number three, proclaiming God's divine revelation with courage. Proclaiming God's divine revelation with courage. We're looking at you from verse 24. Daniel, I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore Daniel went in unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king, I will show unto the king the interpretation. You see that? He said, because Daniel was there, the lives of many other people were preserved. Because you are there, the lives of many other people can be preserved. You can be a life giver rather than a source of death and destruction in the lives of other people. A life carrier, a life giver. Transforming life to all the people. Verse 25, then Ariel brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said, and said thus unto him, I have found a man. Ah, uh ah, -uh, Ariel, did he find Daniel? I said, did he find Daniel? No, Daniel found him. And you know, we make the same mistake. He will say, I have found the Lord. Ah, uh, the Lord is not lost. Who is lost? Ah, the Lord has found us. Amen? Amen. It's the Lord that found us. You know, some people, uh, when they're giving testimony, praise the Lord. Last year, you know, I, I was a sinner, and now I'm saved. But you see, last year, I found the Lord. Uh -uh. Last year, the Lord found me. He found you. Thank the Lord He has found you. And then he brought you out of the wilderness of sin and out of the condemnation, out of the death penalty. The Lord found you. But Ariok said, I found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen? And the interpretation thereof, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded can cannot the wise men, the astrologers, and the magicians and the soothsayers show unto the king. But there's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king, to Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. The dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. Verse 29 As for thee, O king, Thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. Daniel is going beyond what was even demanded. And Daniel said, before I tell you the dream, O king, I know your thoughts. I read your thoughts. He was not in the house with him. Do you see the quality of a spiritual man? Do you see the quality of a man whose eyes are opened, whose lives are touched, who are the gifts of the spirit? Knowing the thoughts of the king, 
even before the king went to bed that night. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What shall come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known unto thee. What shall come to pass? But as for me, this secret was not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. Stop there for a moment. I cannot go beyond that verse without uh, explaining something to you. You know, sometimes we look at courageous people. And Daniel was a courageous man. Why do we say he was a courageous man? He went to God. God gave him revelation. He was so confident and sure of that revelation. Do you understand that if he missed the dream and he missed the interpretation, his life will go for it because there was the threat of death. For all the wise men, if they were not able to reveal the dream, and then if somebody came and just fooled the king and just said something, a guess, and then the king will say, no, that's not the dream I had. Why did you come here? You know I am really, I'm, I'm embarrassed. And you know that I'm alarmed, I'm frightened, I'm afraid. And you know I want to have the dream revealed unto me. And you come here to make a guess and to make a fool of me. That man will die. But this man Daniel was confident. He was courageous. And he came in and he said, I will tell you what you are as dream. And I'm going to tell you the meaning, the interpretation as well. That was courage. But you know what? With courage, there's humility. Hey, look at verse 30. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that, that I have more than any living. You know what I've discovered? Many people who appear to be courageous, they lack humility. Many people who have ability and skill, they, they lack humility. Many people that have talent, they lack humility. Once somebody can do what others cannot do, can discover what other people cannot discover, can endure what other people cannot endure, and can reveal what other people cannot reveal, they lack humility. The people of the world, when they, when they appear courageous, you'll not find humility there. Even people who say they are Christians, once they are courageous people and bold people, they don't have humility. But in the case of Daniel, you have humility plus courage Courage plus humility That's what shows us that this man was a real man of God Now, uh, there, are some, there are some other words We say it's a family of words Along with humility And you find those words Loneliness is in that family Humility, loneliness in the same family Meekness, they're in the same family. Humility and meekness in the same family. Gentleness, they're in the same family. That is humility, lowliness, meekness, and gentleness. And self-abasement. I am nothing. I'm dust and ashes. I'm not supposed to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church and God revealed himself unto me. This is all of grace. That is self-abasement. He that abases himself, God will exalt. He who exalts himself, God will abase. But you'll find people that are courageous in the world there's no humility in them once they have a little bit of courage a little bit of ability a little bit of skill a little bit of boldness then humility flies out of the window let me show you now number one courage and humility and we're looking at daniel again chapter 2 verse 30 but as for me, the secret is not revealed unto me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. That's he had courage, he also had humility. Number two, courage and lowliness. Courage and lowliness. We're looking at Genesis chapter Genesis chapter forty one. Genesis chapter forty one. We're looking at it from verse fourteen. Genesis chapter 41, reading from verse 14. Then Pharaoh said, and call, sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream and interpret 
interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. Pharaoh said, I've heard of you. I've heard great comments about you. And I've heard how knowledgeable you are, how wise you are. And how you are able to get the secret things revealed. And Joseph said, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace courage and lowliness you see if you're a real child of god if you have courage there must be humility there if it is courage and pride uh uh-uh you're not a child of god if it is courage and haughtiness courage and uh, you know a kind of you bulldoze uh, through people because i'm courageous i'm courageous that's not the courage of a child of god the courage of a child of god goes along with humility the courage of a child of god goes along with lowliness i'm talking number three now is courage and meekness courage and meekness we're looking at numbers chapter 12 numbers chapter 12 we're reading verse 3 numbers chapter 12 verse 3 now the man moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth if anybody had any excuse to be proud i think moses had an excuse to be proud that's the man that stood before pharaoh that's the one that his rod became a serpent that's the man whose rod swallowed up all the serpents all the rods of all those magicians of egypt that's the one that raised up the rod like this and then you find that joshua was conquering all the amalekites that's the one that stood before the red sea and then the red sea was parted into you that man was a man of courage a man that was able to lead those three million jews in the wilderness sometimes they wanted to stone him sometimes they asked for food and for this and for that that man was a courageous man and yet with meekness that's how we know a child of god those who are not children of god all they have is courage all they have is courage but courage that doesn't have any tenderness courage that doesn't have any meekness but courage and humility courage and lowliness courage and meekness courage and gentleness we're looking at we're looking at second samuel chapter 22 second samuel chapter 22 i'm reading verse 33 god is my strength and power and he maketh my way perfect. That's the man that killed Goliath. That man had courage. But look at verse 36. Thou hast given me the shield of thy salvation. Thy gentleness has made me great. Thy gentleness. Courage and gentleness. You know the people of the world, if they have courage, then they cannot be gentle. How can they be gentle? Are they not bold? How can they be gentle? Are they not courageous? But you see, children of God, we join those two things together. Courage and gentleness. Courage and modesty. Number five. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 12. Acts, chapter 3. We're looking at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, And and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? And why look ye so, eh, so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? That's modesty. But look at this man. In chapter 4, chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of peter and john they saw the boldness of peter and john that man had courage but he had modesty if you say you are a child of god it's all right to be courageous in fact the lord wants you to be courageous be of good courage and be strong yes but then how about humility or that courage how about lowliness or that courage I about meekness with that courage. I about gentleness with that courage. I about modesty with that courage. Now, courage and self abasement. Courage and self abasement. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse seven. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. We're looking at verse seven. 
It says, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that she might be exalted? That's Paul the Apostle saying, abasing myself, lowering myself, humiliating myself, self-abasement. And yet, look at him now in First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet, I'm not suitable to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. See Paul the apostle, a courageous man. And he went to all the places of the gentle of the gentle world preaching the gospel. He said, I fought for the lions and the bees at Ephesus. And then when the people was going to Jerusalem, and then Agabus took his belt, his girdle, and bound himself. He said, This is what they will do to the man. When he gets to Jerusalem, the people were weeping. They said, Paul, please don't go. He said, What do you mean? Why do you weep to discourage me? I'm not only ready to to be bound i'm ready to die when i go to jerusalem for the lord now that's courage that man was bold and courageous but was that self-abasement self-abasement that's the quality of a christian a person that says i'm bold i'm courageous and it's rude and it's impolite and it's proud and it's haughty and he walks some people that's not the courage of a christian for a christian you are courageous and then there is self-abasement. Number seven, courage and peacefulness. Courage and peacefulness. Have you seen the people of the world who are courageous? If there's no fight, they're looking for a fight. And they say, I'm courageous. Why is it there is nothing to fight about today? I want to fight. That's not the courage of a Christian. The courage of a Christian. You are courageous and you are peaceful. Look at Genesis. I'm reading Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. And you'll see the courage of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 14, reading from verse 14. Genesis Chapter 14, reading from verse 14. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants and uh, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them. And he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobar, which is on the left hand, on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. That man was a courageous man. Courageous, but look, look now at chapter 13. Look at this courageous man in chapter 13 verse 8. And Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my hard men and thy hard men, for we be brethren. It's not the whole land before thee, separate thyself, I pray thee from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, and if thou wilt depart to the right hand, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. And then it says in verse 11, that then Lord chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lord journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lord dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. You see a peaceful man, a courageous man. Yes, but a peaceful man. And that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the irony or the paradox of the courage of a true believer. A true believer has courage. Yes, we have courage. Courage against Satan. And courage against the people of the world. And courage against anything that will stand against our faith. When it comes to standing for the faith, honestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, Yes, we are bold and courageous. We must be bold and courageous. And yet, with that courage, you must join humility. 
With that courage, there must be a present lowliness. With that courage, there must be a practical meekness. With that courage, there must be a visible gentleness. With that courage, there must be an ongoing modesty. With that courage, there must be the self-abasement with peacefulness that you demonstrate. That's how we know the children of God from the children of the world. And thank God, the Lord will do it in our lives in Jesus' name. I come back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We were looking at how now he proclaimed with humility and with courage all that the Lord had revealed unto him. We were told in verse 25, in verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have dreamed? And then he said in, in that verse 20, in that verse 26, and the interpretation thereof, and Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians and the sorcerers show unto the king, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. What did he do? He gave all the glory to God. What do I have? I should give all the glory to God. What do I know? I should give all the glory to God. What do I possess? I should give the glory to God. What has been revealed unto me? I should give all the glory to God. What do you have that you have not received? And of everything you have, everything you know, everything you possess, everything you can do, you give all the glory to God like he did. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. We're looking at it from verse 7. That we must declare the truth of God with courage. And with boldness, there should not be any uncertainty in our tone, in our stand, when we're declaring, proclaiming the truth, the revelation of the Lord. Declare it with courage. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. That word is in your mouth. You have the gospel and you are going to deliver it and declare it and proclaim it to other people in Jesus' name. In Hosea chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4. Hosea chapter 3. We're looking at it from verse 4. Hosea chapter 3 verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an effort, and without terror of him. Afterward shall the children of Israel return. And seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness, and in the latter days. That's telling us then that by the grace of God as we return to the Lord now He's going to give us and show us His favor in Jesus name. As we go on we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. I'm reading from verse 8. Ezekiel 38. Reading from verse 8. 38 verse 8. After many days Thou shalt be visited in the latter times. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. You see, what's the relevance of that to what we're reading? What did, what did Daniel say that makes us to look at all these passages talking about after many days and as well in the latter years? Well, already Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, you are thinking about what will happen in the latter days. What will happen at the end of time? Your mind went from what it is now at the period of the Babylonian Empire until the very last time. And then Daniel is saying, you're not the first one to think about the future, about the latter days. Amos thought about that. Ezekiel spoke about that. Even 
when in fact as you come to the New Testament and you're looking at Second Timothy chapter 3, it talks about the latter days and the latter time, the things happening that will happen in the future. That was a bit of it that the Lord was revealing unto Nebuchadnezzar. It says in Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. And you see Daniel was preparing the ground. He was saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you are thinking about the latter days. And the Lord has revealed unto you what is going to happen in the latter times. And these are the things revealed over and over in the scriptures. By the time you come next week, we'll get into the dream proper. And then you'll see what the dream is. You'll see what the interpretation is. And you'll see the attachment, the association of that dream with what was going to happen in the future. And thank God, because we know it will not take us unawares. It will not take us by surprise. All those things happening will be fully and well prepared in Jesus' name. And when the Lord shall come, we'll be ready for the Lord in Jesus' name. Now, as Daniel spoke about those latter days and gave that interpretation, he was actually standing in the place, in the position of a prophet. Daniel had become a prophet. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ referred to him as Daniel the prophet. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, as a prophet, he revealed divine insight, divine inspiration by the Holy Ghost. He was one of the Old Testament men of men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He was sure of the infallibility of the revelation he had received from God. And he said confidently, I will show unto the king the dream and the interpretation. The king had decided and decreed death penalty for the wise men who had Preferred, who had prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before him. But now Daniel knew that if he missed the forgotten dream, death was certain and sure. It, it, this was no guess work. His gift of the word of knowledge was truly from God. And at the end, he said, this is the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. Even, he even revealed the thoughts of the king's mind before God gave him the dream. Daniel was courageous to speak and to proclaim the divine revelation before the king because he knew that God is immutable, unchangeable, and his message is infallible. Courageously, he, he spoke uh, without adding to or diminishing from the divine revelation. And through his faithfulness to God and his unwavering commitment to declare the revealed truth, he reversed the king's death sentence on the wise men of Babylon. If Daniel had been limited and restricted to what he learned with the wise men of the world, he and his companions would have perished with the worldly wise men. The insufficiency of, of the world's education drove Daniel and his friends to seek the all-sufficiency of God in revelation and inspiration. They laid aside the wisdom from beneath to seek the wisdom from above. The brainwashing of the Babylonian system of education had not affected Daniel in any way. He still implicitly believed in his God. He declared before Nebuchadnezzar there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. There is a God in heaven and is still alive today. You have a problem, there's a God in heaven who solves all problems. You're sick, there's a God in heaven who heals all sicknesses. You have a secret you're looking for, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. He spoke with confidence and courage, the courage of a man who had been in the immediate presence of the Lord. As this man, Daniel, had courage, the Lord is also inviting you to come unto him and he will give you that same courage, that same power. That same boldness and that same assurance and that same certainty. And your life will be a bold, courageous life in Jesus' name. Joshua chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. You'll be strong. I said you will be strong. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. It's starting today in your life. And verse 9, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. The Lord will be with you. 
he will not leave you. I said he came to that crisis and God was with Daniel in that crisis. And he became the solution and not part of the problem. Everywhere you go, you'll be part of the solution. Problems in your life will clear away. Darkness will vanish away. And the light will shine in your pathway in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. What the Lord has revealed to us today, what, he has, what, what we have learned from the word of God. That we too will be able to have the same boldness, the same courage. The courage that goes along with humility. The courage that goes along with lowliness. The courage that goes along with meekness. The courage that is joined with gentleness. And the courage that goes along with self-abasement. The courage that goes along with peacefulness. Pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I've seen a lot today. Everything I've learned today, O oh Lord, I pray you make it practical, visible, workable in my very life. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Daniel, that was an uncompromising man, converted, changed, righteous, pure. And his son of grace. And that same grace can be available in your life. That same grace can be visible, evident in your life. And in a time of personal crisis, in a time of family crisis, you'll provide solution. In a period of church crisis, community crisis, national crisis, you'll be a man like Daniel. Providing solution, not compounding the problem, not increasing the problem. For that to be so, you'll be a prayerful man. A man who has intimacy with God, fellowship with God, by prayer. You'll be a principled man. Wherever you are, whatever it is, there are things you will not do. A man of principle, a woman of principle, a principled man, a principled woman. And your life will be firm, principled, uncompromising. And when people want to do evil, they will not invite you. You will be a salty, wonderful influence. In your community. And when crisis arises, you're one of the people they will call. Because they'll know you, identify you as a prepared man. Prepared in the school of prayer. Prepared by the hand of the Lord, fashioned, molded, transformed by the hand of the Lord, prepared for the hour of crisis. A pure man. Righteous man. There's a man for the crisis hour. A prudent man. Having the wisdom, not of the world, but the wisdom of God. A peace-loving man, a peaceful man. When there's crisis, you'll not be afraid. 
you will not panic. You meet crisis with calmness because you believe in your God. You meet conflict with courage because you believe in your God. You come into a situation that is problematic. You come with the confidence that God will supply the solution through you. That's who Daniel was. That's how Daniel lived. He knew he had just one life to live. And that life will be a life of solving problems. Dissolving hard, naughty matters in society, in his community. A man of purpose, a man of useful, profitable life. The Lord can make you like that. Daniel was not born that way. But he developed a relationship with the Lord, an intimacy with the Lord that made him a profitable, useful, problem-solving man in an hour of crisis. Secrets did not surprise him or judge him. He knew all I have to do is to go to God in prayer. And the Lord will reveal his mind, his purpose, his plan, his will. was a man that prayed a lot and a man that praised the name of the Lord a lot. It was a man who was dead to self as well as dead to sin. No pride in his life. No selfish, position-seeking attitude in his life. All he lived for was to exalt God, honor God, bless the name of the Lord. That's the call the Lord is giving you. To come and live a life that forgets self. A life that exalts Christ. A life that honors God. And a life that is useful. Solving the problems of those who are troubled around you. God gave that man courage. The courage from heaven. Not the courage from hell. You know, Satan is courageous. But Satan is courageous and wicked. But the courage that comes from heaven. That's courage with humility. Courage with lowliness. Courage with meekness. The Lord can do it for you. He did it for Daniel. Did it for Paul. Did it for Peter. 
did it for Abraham, did it for Moses. Courage with gentleness. That's Christian courage. That's Christ like courage. That's courage from heaven. Courage with modesty. That's the kind of courage we have when we come to the Lord. Courage or self abasement. Not courage that is seeking to run other people down. Courage that wants to crush other people. Courage or self-abasement. Courage or peacefulness. The peace of God, deep, overflowing. The peace that passes understanding in the heart of the man where God has put the courage from heaven. Pray that the Lord will make you that courageous in the hour of crisis. When you are the man to declare the gospel truth to sinners, to declare divine revelation to backsliders. To deliver godly counsel to believers. That God will grant you the courage, the boldness. So that the lives of people will be turned around. Will be turned away from sin unto righteousness. Turned away from ignorance. Into the knowledge of the Holy One. What God has done for others, He'll do for you. He did it for Daniel, He's ready to do it for you.